gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce GEO to all of you. As has been said earlier, GEO belongs to the craftsmen. This is probably one of the first private-public partnership where we go on to give craftsmen a sustainable development and livelihood. Ultimately, in a globalized village, the cultural identity is the only identity that we look back to in our roots. In spite of the need of industrialization, handicrafts have always been and continue to be a predominant rural industry, next to agriculture. The rural industry needs to be preserved not only for its beauty and tradition, but also for the reason that it is a major source of income for the dire economic needs of millions. Our craftsmen cannot remain underprivileged of the society. I agree with you, Ella they should have the respect and dignity and the privilege of also being great artists. Economic and social forces provide the necessary faith, space for the full unfolding of creativity and artistic expression. To let these economic and social forces inhibit or restrain the full unfolding of creativity, cultural and artistic expression is possibly one of the most unfair and also most wasteful acts a society can commit. The Asian Heritage Foundation is fighting, it's at the heart of this, of this struggle. And the World Bank is very honored and proud to be associated with CVN and support the development of China. And if it was Kali, he was speaking a craft that was moved under attack from foreign industrialized farmers. He wanted to bring power back into the hands of the village weaver. He wanted to build the local economy and he wanted the urban population to show support for their rural brethren. I am so very glad that this Geo brand is now here to keep his memory alive and to, um, well, promote the ideas that were most important to him. I'm very pleased to see the Amber Blue as uh, Hadu held up as the standard bearer of Geo. To me, it symbolizes uh, many things. It is a woman's tool. It is a tool of the poor. It is not a thing of the past. It is our hope for the future. It shows us the path to a holistic economy. But Jharu is just a very ubiquitous everyday design. But what it actually means to livelihoods also. It has been said Jharu depicts many things. It also to me as a lawyer depicts an instrument of oppression for women. Because I've had several women coming and saying, Fair Charunal Maria. <laughs> <laughs> so that too is 
a reality. So it is all encompassing in our life. I would first suggest that we understand culture as a way of looking at the world. And I don't see that as therefore being a, a barrier or a wall between so-called creative artisans and artists on one side and entrepreneurs and industrialists on the other side. So I don't think there is a divide. We have to see these as a confluence and we have to see the respect hand skills as industry as much as we respect machine-made products as industry. It should nevertheless be driven from the grassroots, not government or world bank driven. And so I hope that while supporting, they will recognize the full independence and autonomy of culture, of diversity, of theater and art that can only bloom by itself and feed on itself. What we call globalization, in that setup, it seems that we are trying to fit into a pattern to suit other people's priorities. And we are sort of playing a role assigned to us. I, for one, am really happy uh, that this wonderful, this brand Geo has come on the scene to put um, our priorities on the international map. I think we are looking at a model of social entrepreneurship and GEO is to me symbolizing that. You are looking for a model of social entrepreneurship where uh, all these people can continue to do in a contemporary way what they have been doing and there is an entrepreneurial framework in which you know, uh, 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 these things can be encouraged and that entrepreneurial framework is going to be really a framework of what, you know, I am calling social entrepreneurship. So it isn't just, just governments uh, through their policy uh, instruments trying to help uh, culture survive and to make it sustainable for those who still continue to practice uh, cultural, uh, cultural ethos, but actually to to see if we can dovetail it with, with modern instruments that are available for ensuring its long-term sustainability and making it part of enterprise. This is a new way of, sort of you know, it costs only about 300, but the, the, the changeover, of, not oh, per piece, but the whole yeah, unit. Yeah, right, right. And look at this, this is Sham, so that, Sham is from Shinadji. The concept of hand-painted mm -hmm. wallpaper. Hand painted wallpaper is a huge market, mm -hmm. huge market. But our problem is we can never bury those huge long scrolls mm -hmm. which are silk screened because they, they don't have homes in their huts. So we said let's do a modular one that becomes even more playful. Mm -hmm. And you can use it in any way, any form, and sort of yet have it hand painted. So all the pictorial traditions of India can come up with a new product altogether. And then to match that product with furniture. He's written Jew. G I I Y. I think what is what is very important is that we we have to value our traditional arts and culture, we have to value them on the same, you know, in the same way as we value urban arts of today. We have gone for the exotic instead of the local. And this is something that is very difficult to wipe out. It's not easy. It will take a long time. But I think GEO is a very interesting initiative in this regard because it can be a bridge you know, between these kind of two, two ways of looking and two ways of valuing. You know, because we don't, we don't need these two different ways of valuing things. But we have continued with the colonial dichotomies of folk, tribal and classical. And that institutionally we have more or less perpetrated them. So you have a crafts museum and you have a national gallery of modern art. Craft, by and large, is the, make, the excellent making with great skill uh, and a, a sense of aesthetics uh, of something that is a repeated uh, object. 
But many painters repeat themselves again and again. No, that, that's another point. So those painters are failed painters. The ones that repeat, the, uh, repeat themselves are failed painters. But this is something that uh, when uh, a craftsman is, he's not innovating, necessarily innovating the design. But when he can innovate the design, then he makes that transition from craft to art. But I hope you didn't mean graduate from being a so-called craftsman to an artist. I think that's where the issue of language comes in. Because in our own language, there is no distinction between art and craft. There is one word, kala, which embraces all of them. And kala also embraces engineering, architecture, dance, music. And it is this integration, this rasa, which in fact is, I hope, what you was trying to do. When we are looking at this vast array of creative expressions, this is what the world understands now as a creative and cultural industry. So there's not Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Textile for some reason also handling handicraft. There is no statistical research on this sector. No mapping. The reason why we fall through the cracks time and time and time again is that at the tables of natural planning, we are incapable of making our case. Can we at least map it? Tell those who talk about this as a sunset industry that there are millions and millions of people who are going to be displaced. There will be more tragedy of migration, more environmental degradation if we do not take seriously the fact that millions of Indians today, tomorrow and day after will have to live by their hands. All I want to say to you is that uh, we in government in different parts are trying to grapple with these ideas and thoughts and it is important to give us uh, some ideas. I think you are suggesting that self-organized sector is what it should be called, I think is a brilliant suggestion. This is something that can be done very easily and it will make an impact because I think essentially we are all trying to give each one of us a little more dignity and a little more uh, uh, personality so that we can fulfill our, our dreams. intelligences do not have to prioritize literacy as the only indicator. Literacy is certainly necessary. No one is. But most of the craft sector, and if you did an analytical exercise, maybe your literacy figures may not be very high, but your cultural and skill figures are extremely high. And I have learnt all my dance from a person who couldn't sign his name. If our education system uh, makes this as part of the whole process of learning, not teaching, uh, I think that we have taken the first important step in the direction for which we are living. Very good! Bye! And in that, I think that we have your commitment to it. A transformation can take place. That is what. No, no, I, I entirely agree, and this is what I was trying to say. If there is, if there's a weaver, and you know better, him better than I do, yes. Where is that weaver? You will. There, we can set up an institution which accredits yes. the quality of that weaver. Yes. We take that into account. He then comes to the school system, right? And then. Or you send the school. Whatever, whatever, whatever we do. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is what I said. That this is certainly what I'm willing to do. What we are taking your statements today to mean is that see in a nutshell, the nature of India's educational system is that it is largely based on Western cultural and intellectual tradition. What we are taking your statement to make is that the Minister of Education is completely open to seeing how we can bring in Indian cultural intellectual traditions in a suitable way and form 
into the education system. Is Not that right? Not committed. Very good. <laughs>